Thank you, Nima. So I brought some wine, because of course, several reasons, I guess. That first, we, we're, we're, we're gonna talk with uncork, so we need some, some wine just to prove that. So I told you there's nothing <laughs> that connects wine to yes. uncork. Yes, we'll, we'll get to that. And so also we are French, so, uh, and it's, uh, it's almost time. But technically I'm American, but okay. French speaking. All right, so, uh, we won't go there. Uh, so, so because we so, were told uh, that we've this... known each other for 20 years, so yes. we can, don't worry. <laughs> so we were told that this is going to be interactive. So we decided that we're going to give a bottle of wine, French wine, of course, to the best question. So you're going to, first you're going to have to ask a question, but second, it has to be a good one. So uh, because Jeff is from a region in France that's very famous for wine, the Loire Valley, we chose a Sancerre. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so here we go. So that's just for the preliminary. So uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Jean-Baptiste Sou uh, Jeb uh, for, for, for my friends. Uh, I'm a principal analyst at Atherton Research where we help companies uh, grow. And um, as, as uh, Jeff said, we know each other for uh, almost 20 years. And um, uh, you came here in the US as the eyes and ears of the uh, Reuters uh, corporate VC fund. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I came about the same time as the eyes and ears of a French newspaper. So I guess you, know, you did Media much, much better. <laughs> uh, but everyone here knows you as a, a very successful entrepreneur, uh, investor, sorry. Fitbit, SendGrid, uh, Postmate, you invested in Front, Mint, Evan Bright, uh, just to name a few. But actually very few of us know you as an entrepreneur. Because 15 years ago, you decided to spend your savings, mm -hmm. $250,000. Some of the savings, yeah, not two, all of them. Yes, not all of the things. So 250K to start a seed fund mm -hmm. and to invest in early stage companies. And from that day, you basically created a new category in the VC landscape. You created the, uh, what we call at the time the super angels, the micro VC. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just to set the stage. You know, we're not just talking to an investor. You're talking also, we're talking also with a, an entrepreneur that just disrupted the VC uh, market uh, for the past 15 years. Okay, with that, um, I've heard and we've, as entrepreneurs, we've heard that there's an overflow of capital. There's lots of money flowing around, floating around. And uh, as entrepreneurs, obviously, we're, one of the things we need to do is, um, you know, we need to fundraise. Mm -hmm. So is that true? Is, or is that a myth? Is that lots of money? Well, there is, I mean, there is a lot of capital which has been raised uh, by VCs at different stages. Um, something to the tune of um, 80 billion was raised by VCs in the US uh, last year, and 100 billion uh, was actually invested by uh, VC firms in the US. B so, billion with a B? Yes, with a, a B. 100 billion. Mostly late stage, so you know, those mega rounds. Uh, SoftBank obviously has changed the landscape uh, quite dramatically over the past couple of years. So, for the first time, I think we had um, over 50% of the rounds being over 50 million. Um, but to answer your question, uh, when, when I started 15 years ago, believe it or not, it was because I saw a, um, a funding gap where it was hard for entrepreneurs who were just looking at raising a few hundred thousand dollars. There was just no, nowhere to go. And so I and a few, um, a few guys um, who ended up being the first super angels uh, tapped into our savings and, and we're writing, you know, small sort of 25 to 50K checks to fund companies to the tune of, you know, 250K for a mashery and, you know, a million bucks for a Truvio and, and anywhere in between. So those were seed rounds? Those were seed rounds back in 2004, five, six. Um, and, you know, fast forward to 2019, uh, the average seed round we invest in is probably, you know, two and a half to three million. The 
the investment that we were making at the time was to really start the company and get the product built. Now, when we invest, um, it's to get the product launched. Um, so there's been a segregation of the market because it's, there are now, last count, and I've stopped counting, 800 plus micro VC firms like ours. And so you have pre-seed, so people who are investing at the very early start um, of, of the companies, um, seed, when we invest, post-seed, which is, hey, you've raised the seed round and you need a bit more capital to get to a Series A, go post-seed. And I've even um, heard of pre-A. So pre-A is like just before a Series A, you know, do a quick like 10% dilution round and, you know, get a, a couple of million dollars before you go and raise an A. So because the market is now so large, everyone has had to sort of figure out the stage focus, the geography focus, the industry focus that they have to claim for in order to um, you know, attract entrepreneurs. It's what I call the shtick, uh, which is you know, important for entrepreneurs, but important for investors as well. So yes, there is a lot of capital floating around. Right. So there's a lot of money. Now it's the, the, the trick is to get it. So, so, so first, I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I have an idea. Which stage am I? Um, so if you are an entrepreneur with an idea but no code or no product that you can demonstrate and, you know, with a little bit of, you know, customer traction or users or whatever, so basically a little bit of data, you're typically sort of pre-seed. Pre-seed. Uh, pre-seed is your you know, a couple of founders, couple of engineers, bit of code or not, but super early in the life of, of the product itself. When you're at seed, typically when we sort of um, get involved, companies have a product, they have, you know, initial sort of market data, they may have um, a few sort of early customers, and they will sort of be able to use um, this data to give us a sense of, their unit economics, their uh, customer sort of life cycle and journey, and we will sort of typically go and speak to those customers in order to sort of get a sense of why this company and not the 10 others, because anytime there is a um, interesting space, you will have four, five, 10 companies right. sort of flocking to it. Right. So how do you how do you choose this one company versus the 10 others? What are sort of the criteria that you're looking at? So every investor has different filters. Um, ours are typically based on, on three things, um, market opportunity, founders, and product. Um, the I, I remember you had, you, you were- Yeah, the, it's three called the three, the, three, the three asses rule. Three, right. um, and so it's a, um, um, Smart as team building a kick ass product in a big ass market. Um, you got it? Three asses. <laughs> um, and so we look at the founders um, do they have the profile experience, expertise, um, you know, sort of attitude that we think is what it takes for them to um, be successful? Is the product 10, 100x better than the rest of the market? Or is there like specific insights that the founders have that will sort of make that product potentially winner? It doesn't mean being the first. It means being the best. And then market opportunities really, as you think about a product that scales, can we get to you know, several hundred million dollars in revenue? Because if you can get to several hundred million dollars in revenue, then you can go public and be successful. So it's kind of a proxy of success. It's really, um, there is a market that supports uh, billions of dollars in, in value creation. Right. And if you have those three components, then we sort of look at other sort of details, but those are sort of the main ones. Right. You have the first question, who wants the bottle? All right, so, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, ju just, just before, yes, yes, okay. so, so is there a mic, uh, a running mic, or, okay. No, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, I know it's recorded, and it's, uh, it's gonna be on a podcast. So, Bill, <laughs> yes. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, I thought you wanted this to be interactive. Yeah. So, so Jeff, um, so thank you for, uh, for coming, first of all. But So your criteria for investment, how would you say your criteria are different from everyone else's? 
do you have a sort of a unique angle or approach or a sort of different angle or insight that you have been able to so successfully apply that enables you to, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff, that enables you to sort of cut to the core and find the best companies as you've been able to do? So, um, as I said, um, short answer is no, because otherwise I wouldn't have passed on Uber. But um, <laughs> the um, longer version is uh, every investor has um, different sort of criteria. Some people will just uh, bet on founders and not care about the product or the market opportunity. Other investors will solely sort of uh, invest on the market opportunity thinking that if the product is interesting and the founders are good enough, they can replace the founders by uh, executives who will sort of take the company to the next level. For us, we really need to three, the, the three components to be there. We will not invest on awesome founders if we don't like the product or the market opportunity. I think the, um, the benefit of having been around for 20 years as an investor and 15 years as a firm is that you've made a bunch of mistakes and over time, you've refined such that you, know, you may still sort of say no to LinkedIn and Uber and Airbnb and Pinterest and a few others, Did but, you? yep, all of them. Um, <laughs> and I'm still there. Um, but you say yes to enough good companies that you're still in business because your returns are you know, allowing you to, um, to be there. The, the challenge for um, entrepreneurs is, because there are so many funds that basically say the same thing, right? as you sort of hinted, Bill, um, you sort of figure out, OK, who has been really good at building a company like mine? And you go and check the track record in you know, SaaS hardware, education tech, health tech, whatever. And you figure out, OK, who is closest to my ideal investor in my space? And is that person sort of already uh, invest in something similar to me, and you should check that. That's part of the, the um, homework that you guys have to um, uh, really sort of do before you reach out to an investor, because you don't want to sort of send to someone who's your ideal uh, investor a, um, you know, a deck about your company, which is exactly what they have in the portfolio already. Right. Did I answer your question? Oh, good. So, now that we know we have, okay, there's a lot of money, we, we know the criteria. Um, what, you know, there's, there's many venues, avenues where we can, where entrepreneurs can find and raise money. I mean, yep. micro VCs, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, that's, you know, that's thanks to you, in part, the crowdfunding uh, law. Um, there's, and, and Patreon, and, and many, many. So, so walk us, you know, how, which, as an entrepreneur, which path should we, should we take? Perhaps it's depending on the stage of the company. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's both depending on the size of the opportunity and the stage of the opportunity. So size, not everything is meant to raise VC funding. Not everything has the potential explosive growth that will get you to, um, you know, tens and then hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, in a few years, because not only do we want the scale of revenue, we want you guys to get there, you know, quickly. And there's nothing wrong in having a company that will generate revenues and profits and be sort of an awesome opportunity for you as founders. It may just not be a good fit for, for venture capital. And so what you would be a lifestyle. I mean, it's, the problem is that when we say lifestyle, it's kind of perceived as kind of insulting. So I think, look, it's, um, there are several you know, businesses which can scale to really sort of large uh, sort of revenue numbers and just not need VCs. So you want to sort of try and, and assess that, and, and you do that with the help of you know, VC friends, entrepreneur friends who will sort of take a look at what you have in mind and say, look, this is interesting, but this isn't going to be enough for, uh, for VCs. And then, you know, you could go to angel, angel groups, uh, crowd, crowdfunding platforms. Uh, Patreon is sort of a great example for, you know, artists. Um, I passed on Patreon, too. Um, just forgot that. Um, even though I've been podcasting for 10 freaking years, so I should know better. Um, it's being a hurtful uh, panel here. And so, 
but that's okay. You just put okay. that in front right. of me. Um, and, and so this, the scale is sort of something you have to um, ask yourself. The size is also, well, how much do I need to raise? Typically, when you raise capital at the early stage is when you're going to have the lowest valuation because the, the valuation is, think of it as a reflection of the risks which haven't been addressed yet. And so when you, you start, you haven't sort of written a line of code, that's when it's the most risky because we don't even know whether you can build a damn product, right? And so you're going to try and raise a little bit of money from the pre-seed funds, um, 250, 500, you know, maybe a million because the valuation is going to be much lower. And then when you come to us, um, you'll get, you know, more stuff done. You will have a bit of traction, a few customers, a bit, bit more data, and that will sort of get you, therefore, a higher valuation. And to be honest, in this environment where you have so many funds, there's also the fact that you always have multiple funds trying to compete for an opportunity, and that drives, you know, valuations Valuation. up just because of the supply and demand, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of imbalance. And over time, you know, things will sort of go up, and at growth stage, it will, you will sort of be uh, valued on, you know, your matrix and your numbers, and hopefully that's when the valuations will be sort of the highest. Obviously, you're investing in uh, not just in Silicon Valley, yep. other, other parts uh, of, of the U.S. or maybe the world. Have you seen a difference in terms of valuation um, uh, here in, in Silicon Valley compared to the rest of the world? Are, are, are companies, more, if, if you're started here, are they more valued here versus? They're more expensive for two reasons. One is... Um, there's typically sort of more investors chasing uh, startups here because um, there's still sort of the old rule of I'm going to invest where I can drive to, um, even though that's changed dramatically in the past couple of years. So more competition, which drives valuations, but also the fact that if you're trying to build a startup in Silicon Valley today, there is so much competition for talent, for office space, for everything that the the size of the round that you have to raise is much higher. Like just thinking, you know, if I used to invest, call it uh, $2 million five years ago, I probably need to raise three or four for exactly the same result, just because of the increase in cost and- um, Housing. And and everything, and everything, right? And so the advantage of um, out of the valley uh, kind of startups Actually, they benefit from less competition on talent, less competition on, on, res on resources in general. And so they're a bit cheaper, but I would say it's not the reason why we go and look at opportunities in you know, Austin, Texas, or in you know, Chicago, or other parts of the US. It's just that we want to be able to access a larger talent pool. And so even our companies in the Valley here, um, when we go and, let's say, company we've uh, invested in at seed, started scaling at um, Razor Series A, we have an um, active conversation with the team about either moving the engineering team, uh, uh, growing the engineering team in a secondary location, or going partially or fully distributed so that we can actually sort of find talent. Uh, it's, it's become ridiculous. Right, right. So, so uh, we, we got the five minutes mark, and uh, five more minutes. Uh, there's a question just behind. Yeah. Um, so we hear VCs talk about uh, a lot of time that, you know, what they're looking for, the companies they are trying to invest in. Uh, not many of them talk about the flip side that how a company should approach VC. So thank you for touching a bit upon that. So in a follow up uh, to that, uh, for example, you know, let's say I'm a founder of a product which does not have a lot of history of you know getting VC or for example it's it's completely something out of the blue like an invisibility cloak you know we don't have a history of uh, VCs or product so two part question is there such a thing that I can pick and choose to apply which VCs to and if there is then what are the best practices because um, I mean, solely on the fact that I don't know anyone in the market who 
has an inclination to uh, you know fund an invisibility invisibility cloak or something related to that mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a great question um, I would look at uh, invisibility cloak that would be useful um, so I think of it as Fitbit eight years ago I mean now 11 years ago sorry 2008 so the the connected potometer wasn't a thing back in 2008 and so what you want to try and figure out is which firm or which partner has a, an interest in funding you know, frontier tech uh, or next generation technology that doesn't really have a market for it. And it's hard to do and it's hard to find, but you sort of look at pattern matching that those investors have demonstrated in the past. And you know, I would guess that there's probably like, you know, Lux Capital, um, the Felicis guys, us, um, John Callahan at True Ventures would sort of show up in your research for the, uh, the thunder of Invisible Cloak because we've done a bunch of things which were sort of frontier tech. Um, and then what you do is you figure out through your network um, who can potentially approach one of those investors on your behalf because even though Nothing says that you need to have access to me in order to get funding from me. Unfortunately, the numbers show that, right? Um, we've invested in 217 companies in the past 15 years. And amongst those 217, one has been sort of a cold call. And it actually um, was just six months ago. Until six months ago, I would have said zero. So it's not that we don't want you to reach out to us, it's just that the, the, the way things work, it's much easier to try and find someone in your network that can vouch for you and can tell us why we should pay attention, where we should listen, because if you know, someone at trust, like one of our founders says, well, this dude has done something really interesting with an invisibility cloak, meet him or meet her, we'll probably take the meeting without really looking for much more because we need that signal. Right. One, one, one more question. Yeah. <laughs> the saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Uh, you've been doing this for more than 15 years. So what has been the most dramatic change over that 15 years, whether it's investors or or founders, and what's remained the same? Yeah, um, great question. Um, so I think that over time we've seen um, like founding teams uh, become sort of more different, more diverse, younger, um, like. This company, which got us to invest in Austin, Texas for the first time, first um, uh, cold email invest that we invest into is actually a team of three 19 year olds. And they had been, that was the fifth or sixth startup, and they had been working together since the age of 13. And, and you come back and you look at your son playing video games and you go, like, what the hell? Um, no, and so okay. I that's think okay. that the, um, it's very hard. Like, I, I find that what's, what's fascinating in, in our job is that we see the eyes, I mean, we, we see the future through the eyes of entrepreneurs, but it's actually much more sort of different, diverse, and you can't really predict when someone sort of comes in whether this is gonna be like an investment for you or not. Um, what hasn't changed, despite all the efforts, is that it's still sort of too hard for people who are not, you know, sort of, uh, university grads, white male, to get funding. And so we're all sort of trying to do our part. Um, we're pretty happy that we have 30% uh, of female founders in our latest fund. Uh, we're trying hard to go for as broad diversity as possible. The issue is we need to sort of figure out how to prime the pump to get those diverse opportunities to sort of come to us. It was just really well crafted and this sort of, um, so the question was, the question was what, what was in that email that you know, got us to invest? Um, so they made a reference to one of our um, very successful investment, and they said, oh, we'll use this um, developer tool, and, and really sort of, um, that's launched darkly, and we really sort of like them, and we thought that if you 
funded launch darkly, which we did, we were seed, the seed lead, you may sort of take a look at us. And here is our story. And it was just like really well done, really well thought. thought. And my partner Andy said, it's in Austin, I'm just gonna pass, but you know, this is actually well written. I'm like, eh, take a call, you know. And, and then he goes like, holy shit, this is super interesting, can you meet them or whatever? And I met those three kids, um, well, younger than my oldest. Um, so like, suddenly you feel like old. Um, and they were like super smart and super enthusiastic and I, I just wanted to spend more time and everybody in the firm loved them. Uh, we took a trip, I mean, my partner and he sort of took a trip to uh, Austin and it ended up being sort of our, our single largest investment ever. So, you know, it's not because something hasn't been done before that it's not about to be done. That's a good proof. Yeah. I think that uh, Nima is on. Can we, can we take one more question? One, okay. One last one. Ah, oh, this. Okay. They really want the wine. Yes, yes. It's going to be tough. Those, those I, are I know. Questions. Those are a very good question. I think we have to. Hi, Denise Bradley Tyson, and I am a founder with a startup. So I specifically am interested in knowing sort of what steps you're taking in terms of diversifying or the outreach that you're doing to meet, you know, non, non, non male, yeah. non white um, founders. No, that's that's a great question, and, and we don't have sort of the the, the great answer to it. Um, we've you know we have over the years. Um, had uh, a ton of sort of very successful sort of female founders. Uh, we have a number of um, Latinx and uh, sort of African American founders. And through them, we sort of try and demonstrate that we're very open to, um, to those uh, types of opportunities. The problem is that 99% of what we do is inbound. It comes to us, right? And we don't have really sort of um, and it's kind of luxury we have because we've been around for so long that we basically wait for things to come to us. And the problem is that um, you know, to get uh, great African-American, Latinx uh, sort of opportunities, we, know, we need to go and seek them proactively and go and implant in those communities that they can come and, and pitch us and, and work with us. And so this is, this is part of something we're gonna be working on uh, with um, uh, you know, in the coming year because what we've seen, like we've, we've just um, had three different sort of Latinx uh, sort of founders funded over the last year. This is great, but it's not enough. So we need to be more proactive there. That's the issue is VC say, I'm open to those kinds of, of deals. The problem is that they don't come to you. You have to go and seek them. All right. So on that note, the Sancerre goes to? I, I'll let you decide. Yeah, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of ADD, so uh, let's uh, give it to the last question, that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.